I trust you brought your Bibles this morning, and you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We will be in verses 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. And as you're turning there, I, I think many of you may know that I have a son. He's a little bit over a year old now, and he absolutely loves to get into everything. He's a ball full of energy and loves to get in the drawers and take everything out of the drawers. And if there's a, a laundry basket folded clothes, he'll take all of those out and dump them on the floor. And if you have kids, you probably know what that's like. There's one thing, though, there's one thing that slows him down, that, that gets him to sit still and that is the TV, or the iPad, or the phone. And I'm going to read this book. It's called Bringing Up Boys by Dobson. And uh, I'm reading along, and he says, you shouldn't allow your child, who's under, your son under the age of two, to watch any sort of TV. Because it's a, a highly devel de developmental stage. They need a lot of uh, human contact and relationship. And so you shouldn't have them sitting in front of the TV, iPad, whatever. So I read that, and I'm like, okay, Dobson's pretty believable. I'm going to believe what he has to say. And so now when my son walks in the room and he sees the TV on and, you know, he looks up at the TV and just stands there, I now hit the off button. I get down on the floor, begin to read with him or play with him because I believe what Dobson had to say, and that has informed or driven my behavior. It works in your life as well, your beliefs drive your behavior. If you're watching the news at all this last week, uh, on Friday there's the March for Life on the Washington, D.C. campus, right? And, and those that believe that, that, that uh, life happens at conception, they, they march to get the attention of the senators, and uh, they wanted them to understand and, and pass laws and all this good stuff, and the belief drove their behavior to get up and travel all the way to Washington, D.C. You go to the gym because you believe in fitness and more energy throughout the day and mobility, and so your belief will always drive your behavior. Well, the text we look at this morning has a section at the beginning that's all about belief. Like, nail this down, get this right, understand this in your heart of hearts, and then that should shape or drive your behavior. And the behavior is three commands that we'll find here in the text. So I trust you're in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. And as we're in Hebrews, the, the human author, obviously we know that the whole of Scripture was, was inspired by God, but the, the human author, we're, we're not really sure who wrote this book. We just know that this gentleman or lady was highly educated, very well put together um, um, book of the Bible. And uh, this, this book has warnings and it has encouragements or exhortations. And what we find ourselves in this morning is in the midst of an encouragement or an exhortation to the church. And that's exactly what this book was written to is the church, the, the believers of that day. And so I'm going to read the, verse, the first three verses and then we'll pause and commentate on that in just a second. So follow with me in verse 19 through 21. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Uh, pa pause right there for a second. Uh, this is the belief section I told you about. It's something that we got to get and understand fully as believers in Jesus. And what he's laying out for us is really two blessings that we as believers have. Two blessings. And, and the first blessing he's talking about is, is access. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have access. And then along with that, we have an advocate. We have access and we have an advocate. The language here is very reminiscent to the Old Testament sacrificial system. If you've ever read the Old Testament, you remember the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness and they had to set up and tear down their worship center, which was called a, a tabernacle. And in the middle of the tabernacle, they had the, the Holy of Holies was where the, the, the presence of God sat. The Ark of the Covenant was there. And you knew he was there, that God was present in that place because there was a cloud by day resign upon that and a pillar of fire by night. And 
There was only one person, though, that could get access into God's area, the Holy of Holies. That was the high priest. And he couldn't go in whenever he wanted, how often. No, he only could go in once a year to offer sacrifices for the people of Israel. So here, the the people that would have received this letter, they're thinking in these terms. That there's this curtain that divides God's presence from God's people. And now the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, no, now as believers, as New Testament Christians, we now have full access to God's throne room. Somewhere where we couldn't go, now we have full access. I uh, used to live out in Denver when I was going through high school, and this lady in my church, she gave me four tickets to the Nuggets game downtown at the Pepsi Center, and so took three of my buddies, and I remember going to the Pepsi Center and being a little bit nervous because these were really nice seats, and, and uh, it's kind of out of my class. I'm in high school, right, and I could never afford these seats, and so I, I show the security guard, the, the person taking the tickets at the door, and he kind of looks at me, and he lets me and my buddies uh, uh, pass by, and, and we go sit down, and I'm sitting there at these great seats at, at the Pepsi Center, and I remember sitting there thinking, man, I am in a place that I don't belong, I could never afford it, but yet I have full access to it, all because of this gift by this lady. This lady gave me something that could get me past, and now I can leave, I can leave, go get concessions, or go to the car, or the bathroom, or whatever, and I can come back in and have confidence, right, boldness, to enter because of this gift. That's that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. You have the blood of Jesus that has covered you, and that's like your ticket. It's your ability to have access now to God. Somewhere you couldn't go on your own, now have full reign and unlimited access. It's it's like authorization. It's the when you're on the computer, it's access denied, access denied. Now you and I have this authorization. Not only do we have access, but we have an advocate. A high priest, uh, one who, who speaks on our defense. It's like God is in heaven, right? He's holy, and, and he doesn't allow sin into his presence. And we have been spotted, and we, we've been separated from God because of our sin. And, and Jesus is there, and he's saying, no, no, this, this person has believed in my work on the cross, and I've covered them with my righteousness, and so he's, he's almost communicating to God. He says, this, this person can come into your presence now. And God then welcomes us because of the work of Christ Jesus. Uh, Jesus is called a, a priest because he fulfilled all of the Old Testament, these sacrificial systems. The best part is he died once and for all. The sacrifice that you had to continually sacrifice over and over and over again every single year. And here Jesus, he does it once and forever. It's a permanent solution to our sin problem. He says then it's the house of God. He's the priest over the house of God. See, uh, in New Testament times, God doesn't dwell now in the tabernacle or the temple. He dwells in his people. And so he doesn't dwell where Humans have built things, but rather he dwells now in our hearts. So now that we have this this belief system nailed down, right? The belief that we have access and an advocate, the writer of Hebrews now goes into three commands. And they all start out with let us, let us, and let us. So let's look now at the, the three commands that the writer of Hebrews lays out for us this morning. In verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The first command that the writer wants us to get is that God is accessible. Draw near to him in faith. The, the question we may have is, well, how do we draw near to God? And the writer says there's two ways. The first is you draw near to God in, in a true heart or with a true heart. The idea is, is a genuine spirit. Not, not a flippant attitude or a cavalier spirit, but rather a true, a genuine, a sincere heart. As we draw near to God, we need to uh, evaluate our heart. 
Is there, is there maybe some hypocrisy going on in our heart? Is, is maybe that we're drawing near to God to put a front on for other people to see? Is it maybe that there's things in our side of our heart that we're trying to hide? Sin that we want to hold on to. If we've grown up in the church, maybe something that hinders us from drawing near to God with this true heart is, is maybe a moralistic behavior. Uh, uh, I, I listen to the Bible. I try and do all the Ten Commandments to behave good in front of God. I try hard to look good for God. But that doesn't align with the beliefs that we just talked about, right? You have access because of Christ's blood, not because of your work. And so coming to Christ with a, a true or genuine heart, and then he says, with full assurance of faith. Full assurance, meaning it is, without, with, uh, it is impossible for us as believers to please God apart from faith. See, we're saved by faith to then walk in faith. And the object of our faith, right, just like the object of your faith sitting down right now is that chair, right? The object of our faith is Jesus Christ, his pers- the person and work of Jesus Christ. But maybe we come to him and we're still hindered. Maybe in our head we think, you know what? Am I really saved? Can I really just walk in and, and have access to God like this? Maybe, maybe we question deep down inside our standing with God. Yeah, we know to believe and, and put our faith and trust in Jesus, but really now as we've gone, we kind of doubt our standing before God. Does God really accept me for, for who I am? And all the guilt and maybe even the shame and the past failures begin to come up in our head and it gets us to almost draw away from God rather than draw towards him. The reason that maybe that's going through our head is because uh, we're not in that belief that we've been cleansed. We've been set apart. We've been made new again by Jesus' blood. And it's almost as if the writer of Hebrews predicts this objection in our hearts that maybe we're not good enough or maybe we can't stand, we're not in right standing with God. And so he says, your hearts have been cleansed, sprinkled clean with a, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with, with pure water. The idea is there, your insides are clean now because of what Christ has done and that interprets, that goes out into your outward uh, behavior. Your body, right, is washed with pure water. There's this cleansing Effect. God is sanctifying you. It's a, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. God is continually working at chiseling away the rough edges in your life. Well, the question may be, well, well what does it look like to draw near? Uh, at the risk of being overly simplistic, it's, it's prayer. Uh, Hebrews 4 talks about we can enter God's throne room with confidence. Because we have someone, Jesus Christ, who has been just like us. He's been tempted in every way that we have been. And now we know that we can walk right in and pray and know that Christ is at God's right hand advocating, speaking well on our behalf. It's scripture memorization. I was just talking last night with a gentleman who works in our Awana and these little kids are, are memorizing scripture. And he says, last night, or this Wednesday night, two kids came to know Jesus. Because of this memorization, because tucking God's word away in their heart, it's, it's reading the word, right? This consistent drawing near is reading the word. The primary way God speaks to us as believers is through his word. This gentleman, he's a faithful member here at our church. He came up to me on Thursday and he said, Austin, how is it that I don't spend more time in God's word? Tell me why. Every time I do, I get more blessed from God. I feel more on fire to do what God wants me to do. Why why do I sometimes skip days and not reading the word? He's like, Austin, I just need you to pray for me that I would just have much more of a thirst for God's word. And in that, he he, he realizes, man, I I need to draw near. The way I draw near is through reading the word. Well, the second command that he tells for us is in verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. 
for he who promised is faithful. I think the second point we can drive from this verse is that God is faithful, persevere in hope. God is faithful, persevere in hope. The Hebrew Christians here that this text was written to, they were undergoing a lot of persecution in that day. Uh, later on in this passage, it, it talks about they were um, openly and publicly expo- exposed and, and afflicted. It even says that some of their property got plundered. So, so the writer of Hebrews wants those Christians, those early Christians, even though no matter how much the, the world is pressing in on you and afflicting you, hold fast. Get the white knuckles out and hold on like you're on a roller coaster. Don't let go. I think in our day in America, I don't know that we deal so much with persecution, but I know that I think most of us can say that we've had the pressure to conform to the world. We've had the pressure to uh, maybe compromise some of our Christian integrity. Maybe that's at work or at home. But we've had pressure to maybe not stand up for Christ the way we ought to. Maybe we've um, compromised with idols. The Bible's full of talking about idols. It's the the thing that draws our affection away from God. It stands between our worship and God. What maybe is that thing that we need to hold fast and say, I'm going to disregard, I'm going to keep going forward. The the idea of holding fast means that there's, there's this danger, difficulty up ahead. It's not easy. You can't just sit on a lazy boy. You've got to be in the ready position. He says, confession of our hope. Draw near and hold fast to the confession of our hope. Well, what is the confession of our hope? The hope is in that Jesus is coming back someday. Right? He's going to take us to be with him someday. So we want to make sure our lives are aligned in such a way that we're ready for his appearing someday. And the confession is the confession that if you were ever baptized here or maybe at another church, you, you confessed or you went public with your faith. You, you told others that I want to follow Jesus the rest of my life. That's, that's the confession. You're, you're admitting, you're testifying of that. It's, it's much like wearing a wedding ring in, in, in when you go around your day. Right? It's the confession that I have been married. I've said vows before witnesses. I confess to that I'm going to stay faithful to my beloved. So the same is true with our beloved, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we staying faithful to him? We know that he is faithful. He, he's faithful. Are we, are we faithful? The the. the um, term he uses is without wavering. Do we hold fast without wavering? Are we, are we stable? Are we steadfast? Are we immovable? I know in a, a crowd this size, some of us may just almost want to even quit. We're just tired. We're worn out. There's maybe a lot of conflict in the home. Maybe the teenager is walking away from the Lord and your heart goes out and you don't understand why they do that after you've raised them the way you have and you just almost want to throw in the towel. You're tired of it. Maybe there's conflict in the marital relationship. Whatever it is, it's the idea of, of don't buckle. Don't, don't turn back. Keep persevering. Keep going forward. I think the way maybe we would say this is, is a long track record of obedience. Do you and I have this long track record of a consistent daily obedience to God? No matter all the different things that could come in and press in on us, are we faithful to the Lord? Can our kids see this long track record of obedience in us? Can our spouse, our coworkers, see this, this long track record of obedience? It says that God is faithful, God promised things, and he fulfilled those things. And he's promised more things And we can be sure that he will come through as he always does. My grandfather, he's since passed away. He's he's a godly man. He's one of my spiritual heroes that I looked up to. And 
one thing that I know about my grandfather is that he held fast to the faith. One of the staples that my family talks about is, is he, uh, he lost one of his sons to a horrible car accident. He almost lost the farm. He went through numerous pastoral positions and the difficulty of, of sometimes being a pastor. And yet it, all those things that, that came in on him, that, that pressed in on him, he never gave up. He, he always would hold fast. And I still remember his, uh, what, what, what allowed him to do that was his consistent daily devotion to Christ. And I remember him sitting in the big, huge chair in the living room and the big Bible and, and the book that he, or the, the, the notebook he would have of all the cousins that he'd pray for. And he'd sit there, he'd read the word to us as, as grandkids. And that drawing near every single day from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. was the thing that allowed him to, to hold fast, to stay steady, to not buckle. So it's almost like these commands begin to build upon each other. As we draw near, we'll have the uh, stronger ability to hold fast and not get sidetracked or um, get tempted in a different direction. So God is faithful. Persevere in hope. The third is out of verses 24 and 25. It says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The third command here is that God will one day judge. Encourage one another in community. God will one day judge, encourage one another in community. It says, consider how. It's, it's almost like give some thought to contemplate how you can make this happen. How you can stir others up to love and good works. In your community, in your church, think about that. Think about it or it honestly won't happen is the idea there. Consider how to make sure you're focusing on others rather than yourself to make sure you can assess their needs and help them get to a good place. Question might be, well, what is... What does the person in my small group need to um, need help with in order to grow? The idea there is spur one another on to love and good works. Love is the internal. Good works is the external that happens. And the word stir up, the, the thing I think about is at the fireplace, you have that huge billow, right? The billow, right? To get the air pumped up into the fireplace, right? As you begin to work and build the fire, it takes a lot of work. It takes effort. And you use this billow to, to kind of get the oxygen pumped into the fire so that it begins to roar. The idea is stir up. Get, get someone on fire. Who's the last person you talked to and got them excited about their call on their life? It takes work, it takes effort, just like starting a fire is. Have you and I thought to stimulate someone to grow closer with Christ? It's not automatic, it's not going to happen by chance, and that's why we need the community that he's talking about here in the last verses. So it's, the idea is don't quit. He says some believers in, in that day, they quit. They stopped going, they stopped participating in their body of believers. They had, they had home groups or house groups that would meet. Because of the persecution, they didn't have a necessarily a big church building because of the persecution. They met in homes, and he said, some people just stopped coming. They neglected the meeting together of the community. Well, why, what, what are some reasons why some people might quit being part of a small group, being part of a church, and maybe someone got stepped on. They stepped on their toes or... Maybe their needs weren't met the way they, they thought they should, or I just, I just maybe don't get along with that person, so I just stopped going. One of the things I talked to my students about, and two students in particular, they, they had some real difficult things going on in their home. Uh, difficult things that uh, I would never want to go through, and a lot of um, divorce going on in the home. And the thing that... Um, I had to challenge these students with was don't give up. Don't quit 
on the community. Because what they want to do is just pull back. Life is hard. Life is rough. I don't like it. I feel uncomfortable. I, I'm going to stop going. So you can't stop going. That's the worst thing. That's exactly what the evil one wants you to do is pull back from community. So in the midst of sometimes with an imperfect people, with an imperfect church, right, an imperfect a unity, a body of believers, there is going to be conflict. There is going to be issues that arise. Your small group, there's going to be people you may not gel with the best, but don't give up. Don't quit. God designed you to be in community. He wants you there. Those in your small group want you there. Here at Crossroads, uh, I remember when I first got here, we didn't have a young couple small group, so we rallied up like two other couples, and we just kind of, we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't even know what a small group was, and we, we got together, and we just met, and we prayed with one another, and um, now as we've gone the last couple years, we've been multiplying different small groups, and there's been about four to five young couple small groups here at our church, and they've been just so vibrant, and we've had a lot of fun together, a lot of good relationships have been built, and I got to tell you, we've gone through some pretty deep things in our small group too. Some of the couples have, have dealt with miscarriage. Some of them have, have even dealt with cancer at a young age. Some have dealt with a lot of conflict with, with in-laws and extended family members. I tell you what, those that are walking through and that are in, are in a small group, they never regret being in a small group during those times. They never regret being part of a community that loves them. So the question is, are you part of the community? Are you part of the church here? Have you become a member? Have you welcomed yourself and embraced the church? Have you um, started going to a small group? We've been talking about that the last couple of weeks and the importance of that. And in the community, maybe you're here and you're, you're like, I've been part of a small group. I've, I've been involved. My question to you is, to, my challenge to you is, who can you speak life into, speak a word of encouragement into? I gotta tell you, every time in my spiritual walk with the Lord, I've never grown so much as when someone pulls me aside and they speak into me. Say, Austin, I see this in you. Or Austin, you need to check this in your life. And those have been the moments where I've seen the most growth in my life. So who are you mentoring, if you wanna use that word, or speaking life into, and then who is doing that on your behalf? into you? Are you seeking that out as well? The redwood trees, they're out in California. They're big, huge trees. Uh, magnificent, beautiful trees. And uh, the thing is, these, these trees hardly fall down. And the, the, the weird thing about these trees never falling down is their, their, their root system is super shallow. They're not, they're not that deep. So that if you were to almost transplant one of these redwood trees out in California to the, the Great Plains of Illinois and a windstorm would come, that tree would just topple over, no question. So the question is, how does these redwoods, these huge, magnificent trees, hold up out in California? And what they say is, what happens underneath the soil is these, these huge trees, although the shallow root system, these roots begin to interlock with the trees around them. And that's what makes them sturdy. That's what makes them firm. It's the same way with our lives, right? Are you out in the plains of Illinois by yourself almost going to get toppled over? Or do you have a people group, a community around you to hold you up, to interlock their lives with yours, to boost you up when you go through difficult, trying times? The last is the day. It says, do all of this, encourage, be part of a community because you know the day is drawing near. The day he's referring to is the day where we will give account someday for all that we've done here on this earth. So we stand before God, and so he says, you know God will judge one day. So do your best to be part of a community, to encourage one another. Spur them on, stir them up, stoke them up to love and good works. So I don't know where you are this morning. I trust that your belief will back up your behavior, will drive your behavior this morning. So um, with that, let's, let's pray together. Father, we 
love your word. God, we know that is the primary means by which you speak to us, your children. God, we thank you that we can read it and understand your heart for us and your desire and design plan for us. I pray that the, the things we talked about this morning, the belief, Lord, that you want to anchor in our hearts, for that that be the case. And out of that identity in you, we would operate in a right behavior, a right way. God, I pray for the one here that may be far from you, may be distant. I pray that they would draw near to you. I pray that they would not be hindered. Pray for those that just need to hold fast, stay committed. Pray for those that just need to be part of a group, a small group or close-knit community. Lord, I pray for that. I pray that they would not hold back. I pray that they would fully engage. God, we bless you. We thank you for being our great God. In your name we pray. Amen.